Hello and welcome to Comic Island. So I hope you guys are doing well. I thought I'd make this video. Basically today we're going to go over our, my top 10 list of 2015 comic book adaptations. So by adaptations, I mean video games, TV shows, movies, whatever. Anything that's taken comics and brought them into some other form of media. I went through a whole bunch of TV shows and movies. Uh, to make this list and I kind of just used my own basis of judgment and tried to compare them to which ones I enjoyed the most. And it is a little tough to compare like a video game to a movie, but I just kind of rated the experience for what they are and pretty much came up with 10 that I'm pretty happy with. Uh, let's talk about the honorable mentions really briefly. Uh, what didn't quite make the list. Like I said, it was a good list. There's only one thing out of everything that I went through, aside from some just tie-in video games and the sort of like junky video games where they're just like going after free to play stuff that I didn't even really consider that heavily. Um, only one thing I found really bad and that was the Fantastic Four which gets a dishonorable mention here. Uh, honorable mentions are ones that actually I seriously considered for this list and uh, really enjoyed. Just it was competitive and they didn't quite make it. So that includes The Walking Dead, Agent Carter, Supergirl, Infinite Crisis, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Arrow, Batman vs. Robin, and Fear of the Walking Dead. All good to varying degrees. Um, Fear of the Walking Dead kind of being at the bottom of that honorable mentions list for a reason, because that one I was a little iffy on, that's for sure. And some that were very good, like Agent Carter and The Walking Dead, that just didn't quite make it, but were great entries nonetheless. Alright, so let's get started with number 10, and that's Constantine. Yep, so the tail end of season one of Constantine sort of ended uh, really early on this year, like in February, or of last year I should say, because we're now in 2016, uh, and I liked Constantine. It was a, a nice adaptation of the source material. It was uh, this kind of paranormal show that I could really get behind. It's a real shame that it had to kind of end there, but because it was cancelled due to low ratings, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed watching it. I thought they had a really good job with the casting and kind of the way they set up his universe and what kind of stories they were telling and could tell with him. And it's a shame that they didn't get a second season. Uh, he did have a cameo in Arrow, and I kind of hope that CW might make more use of Constantine if they can and bring him into the mix because they're doing a lot better, uh, both in terms of ratings and options, because he could be excellent in Legends of Tomorrow or something like that. But whatever they do, it was fun while it lasted, I guess, and it is a shame, but I did enjoy the first season of Constantine, including the back half that was aired in 2015. And so that's all I can really say about it. Like I said, it, it sucks it was cancelled. That's one that uh, we didn't win on, I guess, but, you know, as comic book fans, uh, some you can't, not everything's going to be a success, not everything's going to work, and... Of course, NBC couldn't find an audience for them because they're NBC, and that's a whole other thing that really doesn't have much to do with the source material. All right, so let's move on to number nine, and that's The Flash. I really like The Flash. I'm surprised it ended up down here, um, but basically this is the... When we consider 2015, that's the end of Season 1 and the beginnings of Season 2. And while I really, really enjoyed Season 1, I thought it was a cool, faithful adaptation of The Flash. They kind of embraced his rogues gallery. It's pretty well cast and really well done in certain ways. The way they go about, like, Eobard Thawne. It's a cool show, and it's something I really enjoyed more than I thought I would. Um, second season's been a little tougher, and I think that's what kind of brings it down, is I really like the first season as a whole, and the way they did certain things and revealed, like, vital little plot elements was really well done. Second season's been a little worse for that, and they've done some cool stuff in season two, but it has been more of a mix because of it. There was a scene in Season 2 where the Flash is rendered temporarily blind and he had to go through this awkward date where, like, his buddy is coaching him through a mic. That happened in a 2015 TV show. Like, that's... That's the something I'd expect out of Three's company. Not, <laughs> like, the friggin' Flash. And the, his whole relationship with Patty Spivet... Yeah. That's been the most awkward, giggly mess of a relationship in a TV show that I've seen in a very long time. And so I've had a lot more problems with season two and getting behind it. But I still love, like, I love the guy playing The Flash. Uh, I love the guy who plays Eobard Thawne. And 
A few of the other characters are really good. Flash's adopted dad is really good. Captain Cold is amazing. Who was it? Like King Shark, I think, showed up in season two. He looked awesome. And Gorilla Grodd it looks amazing. And it's so cool that the show can do this. And they kind of, they were more successful than I think they realized. So they were able to expand their budget and do stuff like Grodd. And I'm so pumped for that. So The Flash has been great. The fact that it's only at number nine is just because of these awkward things. But it's still a great show. And one that I thoroughly enjoyed and still watch every week because it's just, it's so fun. So let's move on to number eight. And that's Gotham. So, Gotham was another surprise. I didn't really expect much out of it because I wasn't too thrilled with the premise. The whole idea of like, yeah, it's Jim Gordon and it's in the past and we're going to set up all these villains and Gordon's going to be the young action hero while Bruce Wayne is just this kid. That's a recipe for a disaster on its face. But when I actually sat down and watched Gotham, I have to say I was impressed. It, it has its own identity and direction and that really goes a long way. What I mean by that is like, they kind of have this clever, like, interspersed plot line with all these characters. Like, it's got this huge cast, a lot of recognizable Batman names, and some new ones to varying degrees of success. But they do such a good job at having this, like, timeless world where it kind of looks like the classic goth-style Gotham where everyone's wearing, like, trench coats and, like, 50s-style dresses and that sort of thing. And they use typewriters. But then they use cell phones, too, because it's deliberately this timeless era that's just sort of fits in with the plot line. It's all very deliberate and very well done. And yeah, I don't know. I just I, I kind of really was surprised how much I got behind it. Uh, I love like the penguin and he's like he's a starring character in this show. And he's so well done as like this young character involved in the mob and working his way up. And they kind of bring a lot of the villains to the fore. They take advantage of the fact that Batman has one of the best rogue galleries out there. So then it just becomes a story about like Jim Gordon dealing with these various villains. You kind of see how he starts out extremely idealistic and is gradually being corrupted by Gotham while also still being Jim Gordon. And that's a pretty cool line they walk. And then he's dealing with like pretty well done versions of Batman's villains as they're like forming or have already started up. And he's kind of dealing with characters like Dollmaker like that who have been operating for a while. Or they are like in their beginning stages like the Penguin or Joker. So and it's just a unique entry on this list because it has this style and it direction and stuff like that. And that's what I mean when I'm saying that. Like it's focused. And that focus really kind of sets it apart from some of the other shows because it has its own identity because of it. That one deserves its number eight spot, and I really was impressed by it. Number seven, Gods and Monsters. So Gods and Monsters was a, a bit of a surprise for me. I kind of just watched it when I was making this list thinking like, oh, well, it's the only animated DC movie I didn't see out of the batch last year, which I think the only other one was Batman vs. Robin, which I found a little underwhelming. So I wasn't expecting much out of this. It looked like some alternate universe stuff, and I didn't really check it out much more than that. I just assumed it would be like the Crisis of Two Earths or whatever that movie they already did was called, and that was that. Then I sit down and watch it, and it's awesome. It 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 is an alternate universe, but it takes place entirely in that universe. So Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, as we know them, don't appear, and instead uh, Superman's kind of this son of General Zod kind of thing and he was raised by immigrant parents instead of the Kents so he's a very different character Batman is the man bat or some kind of iteration of him so he's basically like just a vampire and Wonder Woman is one of the new gods or something like that like she escaped from Darkseid's planet so I don't know what she is exactly but she's a god just one of the new gods kind of deal and that makes for a cool ass movie so it's not perfect. It has a few corny lines, and by a few I mean quite a few, but it is so cool to see this. So it's just like this completely fresh take on the DC universe. If you can't tell, these uh, these versions of the three, like the big three heroes, are very different from the uh, Central Justice League, and they're a lot more willing to kill and just kind of act like this rogue security force that the police are not thrilled of, but no, they can't really do anything about. So that's really interesting. And then the villain, who I'm not going to reveal here because it's great and it's so cool to see this guy like in a movie, even if it's animated, as like a central character because I've always been a fan of him, um, we'll say. 
But if you've seen this movie, you'll know what I'm talking about. And the whole thing works so well because of it. Because it's just, it's so different. And it's enjoyable from start to finish. And if you watch, like, the Justice League cartoons in the 90s or have been enjoying some of DC's, like, animated movies that they release, Gods and Monsters is definitely worth checking out. It's really cool and was surprising, like, how much I enjoyed it. But just uh surprising at how different it was. And, again, it's kind of like Gotham. It has a sense of direction and focus. So it stands out because it's so unique. Um, there's nothing like this. I can compare anywhere else on this list, or even in the honorable mentions or anything like that. It's its own beast, uh, and it was really interesting to see. I was really surprised when they didn't cross over with the main universe, like in Injustice, like in, in the Injustice game, I should say, or something like that. Uh, no, it's just a completely different alternate universe where they're telling a story in that universe, and that made it really interesting and really enjoyable. Uh, it's cool to have a like movie about like Kirk Langstrom version of Superman that's closer to Zod and like a very different Wonder Woman and just to see it all mixed together with uh, a very interesting villain and that made for some stellar stellar entertainment overall highly recommend all right number six Daredevil now that one isn't too surprising season one of Daredevil came out this year it was great um it actually it's surprising it only made it to number six uh having like, earlier in the year, after I had just seen that show, I would have put it really high. But that was before some other stuff came out that did supplant it. Nevertheless, Daredevil is an entertaining show. In some weird way, does kind of redeem the Daredevil movie. Like, I know that's a weird thing to say, but a lot of people just expressed relief at ha finally having a an adaptation of Daredevil that does justice to those comics. Because he's he's stellar. He's not just a Batman ripoff. Maybe that's kind of where his origins might sort of stem from, but he's a different beast, and they finally kind of were able to do that in this show and realize what's cool about Daredevil, what can be different about him versus Batman, and how to make a, a good story out of him. And the Kingpin as well, who's also amazing. And I mean... I don't need to go into it too much because there's been a lot of YouTube channels and shows and stuff that have done a pretty thorough analysis of Daredevil episode by episode. You get the idea by now. Uh, if you're a comic book fan, you've probably digested this content to some degree or another or have your own opinions. It's not a perfect show, but everyone I talk to gets drawn into it at some point in the series. Like, it's either, like, personally, I was a little iffy on it at first, but over time, as the show got further and further in, I got more and more into it. Some people were the opposite, and they got really drawn into it at first, and near the end, they weren't quite into it as much. But either way, it it pulls you in at some point or another, and it's able to do a lot and have really interesting content and depict these characters in a really cool way. The Kingpin was fascinating, and that's still, like, one of the best performances out of this list in terms of like adapting a comic book character. And the key about adaption is you need to, like you shouldn't just carbon copy and paste it because he's not really like the comic book version of the Kingpin. Exactly. He's a little more subdued and subversed. And once you kind of realize what he's going for, it works tremendously well, but it is, it's different. And I, I liked that. I liked the difference, and I liked how he was such a complicated character. Some of the supporting characters are a little more ambiguous. Like, Foggy Nelson and Karen Page are good in this show, but they don't add as much as they could, or they do in the comics. Um, it's not a huge complaint, because you have, like, the Kingpin and Matt Murdock running around, and they're kind of the central thrust of the story and what makes it interesting, but there are weaknesses here that do kind of annoy me. Um, they make the show not perfect, but I'm still like really looking forward to season two because they did a lot right and they set up a lot and they, they brought us into this Netflix world where, you know, it's going to be a different tone from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but still within that same universe. And they showed us how it's going to fit and it, it really is a good as a start to all this. And I really did enjoy it. Uh, the fact that it's here means something, like, on the list. And I'm not just breezily putting it at number six. I, it was enjoyable and highly recommended if you haven't seen it yet. 
um, and was overall a really cool adaptation of this comic book character. Alright, number five, Jessica Jones. So, this one's probably going to be a little bit more contested. I've kind of indirectly heard some people didn't really like this show as much as I did. I understand that. It's not perfect either. Uh, it in particular has one lull point, and while Daredevil, I've heard people say, like, they don't like certain episodes and really like other episodes that I don't necessarily like. For Jessica Jones is a different beast. Seems like most people can agree there's one lull in this story when, uh, th with all the stuff with the cage, I think we can all agree. It got interesting, but was kind of, kind of veered off in weird directions at times. Uh, regardless, Jessica Jones is, uh, a really interesting show. And, it's a different beast than Daredevil. It's more of like this kind of hard-boiled detective-y show. I guess it's also kind of doing its own thing, but it, it all works. And it's there's so much I like about it because it's so different from everything else on this list. Like it's a, it's a quieter show. Like people say there's not enough action, but there, there didn't need to be action. That's not what the point of the show was. It wasn't an action show. It wasn't kind of like, what Daredevil was going for, which is more combat oriented. She wasn't an active superhero. She has PTSD. She's not going to go around fighting people all the time. And that's what made the show interesting is it was cool and different. It, like, it's not, it's not like a traditional superhero show, but it's so good. Like it's got, so she's great. I loved her character overall. I liked how she kind of played off this vulnerability by acting tough, but you could tell it was all just this front because something terrible happened to her and she's just unable to process this fully. Like even years after the fact, the supporting characters are all great. They all kind of have their own arcs and trajectories and their own motivations and stuff like that. And I really, really enjoyed the show. And then on top of all this cool stuff is Kilgrave, who's menacing and awesome. And David Tennant does such a good job here. And I was so impressed by this show. This this made me so much more excited about the Netflix stuff. And I already was pretty excited. I was already on board with Daredevil. This made me like, oh man, I can't wait for the Defenders now. Can't wait to see Luke Cage get his own series because he was awesome in this. I can't wait for like freaking Iron Fist. If this is the kind of quality stuff they're doing. And this is the same sort of like multi-genre thing they're going like they do in the Marvel Universe. Like I didn't realize that. I figured they were all going to kind of be like Daredevil. But no, they're kind of doing what they did with the Avengers, where each of the characters kind of gets their own genre of specific movie. So like Captain America is sort of that pseudo-political stuff, action movie-oriented mix. Uh, Iron Man's like sci-fi mixed with like just quirky comedy mixed with, you know, an action movie. And Thor's kind of these grandiose epic adventures. They're, it seems like they're going for that with the Defenders. So the Defenders will each have their own kind of thing and then it will all mash up into this awesome 10 part series that I'm so looking forward to. So I I don't know, I just loved it to pieces. I really enjoyed everything about it. Like I said, there are flaws, there's lulls and parts that I guess people found boring, but I found fascinating. I found the whole thing just great and highly recommended. I, I gotta stop saying that. I recommend all these things on the list. <laughs> um, but yeah, just, it was great. Th like, this is the point on the list where we're getting to stuff that I was really excited about that left me wanting more. I really hope she gets another season of this stuff because I could, I could watch this show for days. It was so neat. And like, you kind of get the sense, like all the characters do have their own little stuff to them. And, from like her friend who's a broadcaster and does seem to be wanting to help Jessica, but I get the sense that there's more to her motivation to like Kilgrave who's got his own thing going on or like the cop who's kind of this weird character. He might be the weak point actually now that I'm thinking about it, but the lawyer is a great character too. I should know names, but you know, whatever. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about if you saw the show. So it, it's hard not to talk about this and just talk about the parts I like and what was so good about it. In particular, I love the scenes where you show Kilgrave's powers. It was one of the most effective demonstrations of the devastating power he has over people. And 
by him, I mean, like, cause we've seen telepaths before, but they're usually Professor Xavier, Jean Grey, and then using heroic stuff, or just doing mild things like, you know, talking to people from afar. And I get that they're a little different from this, but this is, this is mind control at its finest, where he's just, does it instinctively and he gets people to do these insane things because they just they have no choice they don't even think about it they just do it anyways um yeah so jessica jones is great let's just move on to number four arkham knight holy crap arkham knight so i made a video several months ago now talking about why we weren't really going to do let's plays about it even though we said we would because it just was such a technical mess at the time and that does matter. There's a reason I'm bringing that up. If a movie came out and it didn't work, like for some reason it just caused projectors to explode and it took months for them to fix it and you couldn't see it long after when they said it was going to come out, that would kind of influence my opinion of the movie. And that's what happened here. I was all set to download it like the day it came out. And then I saw that like it basically wasn't working on like PCs and frames would drop. It would be really buggy. There was just so many problems and then they just pulled it from the steam market to fix it which took months like an insane amount of time and while it's kind of good that they did this because it's pretty unprecedented for any company in terms of gaming to do that and i do appreciate that like holy crap so that that was not a great start to this game but when i finally was able to play it and sit down and actually enjoy this game i really liked it and at first I was just like, oh, well, you know, I liked Arkham City. I liked Arkham Asylum. I was, I tolerated Arkham Origins, which is a whole other conversation for another day. But I was kind of like, oh, okay, so this is more of the same. And I was kind of getting bored with it at first, just sort of like being, you know, it was cool to have the Batmobile. It was cool to have this stuff, but it was getting repetitive because at this point I've played a lot of Batman beating guys up running around in stealth, doing all the Batman things, finding Riddler trophies over and over and over again. At a certain point, you get a little bored. But then I started playing more and more of the story. And I really liked the story. And that's saying something because one of the villains who's publicly advertised, the Arkham Knight, is a bit obvious. And that's all I'm going to say on the matter. <laughs> but... And so I, I'm a little divided about it all. In the end, I'm kind of really happy about the game as a whole. There's a lot of twists and turns that I didn't see coming, aside from the Arkham Knight, that change it. And I would say this game really has three villains. The third one being a real mystery, and I'm not going to give away here. But it's not what you think. It doesn't work the way you think. And the way they do work with it was actually super interesting and really fun and cool and different. It's never happened in the comics before, let's put it that way. They were ne they've never been able to do something like this. And man, is it cool. I, it made the game for me. And to the extent it's number four on this list because it's so fun. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed it once I kind of got past that initial hump. It's on here by the merits of its story by a wide margin. At this point, the game is getting a little old. It just feels like it's a little worn out at this point. Like, I'm just not getting into the whole stealth gameplay and combat like I used to, because at this point, I've had my fill of it. In the broadest sense of the term, the gameplay hasn't changed by much. And it's great gameplay. That was what was so great about Arkham Asylum, is it was one of the first games to really mix like both combat and stealth so fluidly. Usually what games are good at doing one of the two, but with Batman, like the transition was seamless and always both modes were fun. But by the time we're at game four, I'm getting a little tired of it, and they haven't really done any revisions to it. That being said, Arkham Knight does present it in a new way in the sense of, like, they go to lengths to make it clear that you're not just fighting random thugs in this story. You're fighting a militia, a trained army of mercenaries. So they have a lot of tech. They get used to your, like, strategies during stealth. So they'll try and, like, group together. They'll check for vents if you're using the vents. They'll start just blowing up the little platform things you hang on. Uh, if you're using those, they adapt and kind of change. 
they were doing that in Arkham City, but they do it to a real extent here that it feels like you're, you're legitimately challenged in a way that you weren't in the previous games. That's good, but it's not enough. Um, and the, the Batmobile stuff is a lot of fun, but I found it was getting a little repetitive after a while. Although there's nothing like it in this game when you're just, like, driving around, ramming through the sides of buildings and doing all these amazing things. You can turn the Batmobile into a tank. It's cool. And then you can leap out of the Batmobile and then just soar through Gotham. And Gotham looks great. Everything looks awesome. But what really brings it up so much on the list and why I like it so much is that story. And I don't really want to give anything away. You need to kind of experience the story within the context of the game. Because if I explain it to you, I can't do justice for the way it presents the story. The context it delivers it all in. And the way they reveal information and tell the story in a certain order works really well. I'm actually astounded by how well it works, how well it was like sequenced throughout the story and delivered, and I just can't get over how good this game is. There's stuff that I can't really give away, but like you'll you'll be swinging through the city doing side quests, pull yourself up on a roof, and some of the story will reveal itself. And totally like get me by surprise because I'm just thinking about something else like within the game, like trying to get to a certain objective and it just slams you with a little bit more story and a little bit more context and a little bit more of the universe and it always works so well. I like I'm in spite of all these technical problems, I just have to put it here because it's just such a thoroughly enjoyable game in spite of being like the fourth in a series. Like I said, the gameplay is not good enough to justify this story almost like it, it, it does feel kind of repetitive and stale and if it didn't have this awesome story to back it up i wouldn't be into this game but especially after arkham origins it's nice to get back to writing that's closer to like arkham city let's put it that way okay i need to stop talking about this because like i could talk about that game for a while though because it's just so dense with interesting material and i might have to make a more spoilery review where i talk about what works uh, but we'll do that separately because unless you've played Arkham Knight, I really, you really shouldn't hear this stuff because you need to kind of do that to appreciate this story. Let's move on to number three, Age of Ultron. But yeah, this, this movie was great. Honestly, I'm surprised that it's only at number three. Uh, when I saw it, I assumed it was going to be like my favorite, well, maybe not movie of the year, but certainly favorite comic book movie of the year. I didn't think something would top it. And we'll get into the, what topped it in a second. But man, it was like, I, I made a list of my most anticipated movies and this was at the top. I was really looking forward to this as a follow up to Avengers, which I really enjoyed and think was a bit of a turning point in comic book movie history. Well, not think it was. And I just thought it was just this perfect fusion of all these different elements into this really fun, simple, but well made and clever in its own way, uh, movie. And on the whole, Age of Ultron is a superior entity to the first Avengers movie. But I still kind of like the first Avengers movie more. And so let's get into why. So, they, well, I can summarize why in one sentence, really. The whole is not the sum of its parts. The parts of Age of Ultron are great. Uh, free with uh, having to, like, fully introduce the Avengers, because, it, you know, at this point it's safe to assume that most of the audience has seen or is at least familiar with the premise of the Avengers by now. It's able to kind of leap right into the action, which it literally does. <laughs> That's how the movie starts, and it's awesome from here. Now, I'm going to assume most of you have seen this movie, so I'm not really going to worry about spoilers. But, like, Ultron is great, and the new characters Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch are great, and, and Vision, he's awesome too. Um, and everyone kind of works together well. And it, like because they don't have to worry about introducing stuff, they have breathing room to do stuff like them all going to the farm for some reason, and them having the party at Stark's Tower. All of that stuff works really well. There's also great action. That final climatic battle goes big and goes strong, and it just works for me. It, it does a lot of like it does that cool comic book thing where Iron Man, Vision, and Thor are firing their beams on an Ultron, and he like just gets defeated by the overwhelming awesomeness of the Avengers and. A lot of it works, but collectively as a whole, oh, and there's cool cameos too, like uh, you get uh, War Machine and the Falcon kind of showing up, 
you got a neat little cameo with, um, the, um, what's his face? Claw, who's definitely gonna be a bigger role later on, what with all the Black Panther stuff. And, uh, you know, a little bit of build up for the Avengers with Thanos and all that. All of these things work and are great. And I would say are done better than the first movie. Like, there's a lot of really funny lines. There's a lot of great action. There's a lot of iconic little moments. Like, I remember when, uh, when all, th- what they do with Ultron, where he constantly is improving himself and he's talking to Black Widow and he just tears apart the older model of himself because, you know, that, that's Ultron. He just keeps improving himself, getting better and stronger. It's so cool that they were able to depict that meaningfully in this movie. That all works and works really well. The problem is, somehow, it cobbles together into a bit more of a mess. The first Avengers movie is really well structured, and it actually is a little uneven at certain times. Like, it slows down, it picks up, it has weird balance issues, sort of. But it works as a cohesive whole, and you end up leaving that movie being like, that was awesome, like, this is the start of something cool and like you you kind of are made to root for the team and when it when it all works you're as happy as marvel about like everything coming together and it leaves you with like this certain feeling age of ultron doesn't quite do that but it's still a lot of fun and it's still an enjoyable experience it just doesn't live up to uh, the first avengers And maybe it's unfair of us to compare that. Like, it's still a great movie. It's still one of the best in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, But it does kind of leave you with, like, weird iffy feelings. Like, Thor's vision quest, which is a term I think fits quite appropriately, uh, doesn't really go anywhere and is really awkward relative to the rest of the movie. And that, that part was just confusing in the sense of, like, its place in the movie and There's a lot of weird choices like that, where you can kind of see the internal conflicts going on between Disney and Joss Whedon, where they're trying to do all this world-building stuff, and he seemed a little more interested in telling a more personal tale. Personally, I probably would have preferred the more personal tale, and they could have just done without all these references to Thanos. That stuff will publicize itself, and they have plenty of time to kind of slowly build that up and then phase three movies. So, but, but whatever, who cares? It's, it's all, it's fine. Um, <laughs> and I know I'm sounding dismissive or weird about it, but it's just kind of one of those things where it's a little bit annoying. The whole movie works. Nothing's bad enough to break the movie, which is good. It just wasn't quite what I thought it would be or could have been. It could have been something like The Dark Knight, not in terms of tone, but in terms of taking something that you've started and built and taking off with the idea. And they kind of do that. They do push certain ideas, and they do a lot of fun with the characters and their powers still, but they didn't really go like full tilt as much as I think they could have if they just kind of left some of the world building to just the sidelines. Little bits here and there, a post credit scene or two, and that's it. Instead, it's just kind of, it's everywhere. And that, I think, is a bit of a problem. Because then you have too much of, like, Ragnarok being built in. Civil War coming into this. All these things that are kind of poisoning the brew uh, to a degree. But it's still so good. There's still so much to enjoy here. I like how they kind of made Hawkeye into a little more of a character. I thought the romance stuff between Bruce Banner and Black Widow was a little weird. But once I kind of got past it, it was interesting and added a dynamic. And I do think there were relatively solid hints of this in the first movie. I don't get the people who say there were no hints. Did you see the first movie? Like, they weren't in love, but they there was something between them. There was definitely chemistry there. Uh, whatever. It's all, it's it's a good movie. And it was fun overall. There are problems, but it's third on the list for a reason. It was fun. It was great to have Joss Whedon back, even if this is kind of probably his final outing with Marvel, and was just uh, a real treat. It, it's a serviceable sequel to The Avengers. It's not a earth-shattering one, but it's it's a good one. It's not one that I feel like lets down the first movie in terms of like, because you know there are sequels like Batman and Robin that just sort of bring that whole era of Batman movies down to a degree because people associate them with one another. 
It doesn't do anything like that. It's still very good. It still is one of the better movies I saw last summer and is definitely one of the better iterations of a comic book out there. Um, it just wasn't, it just didn't form into something quite like the first Avengers movie. It would be hard to duplicate something like that. That just, that just worked and clicked together just so well. But there's still a lot to like about Age of Ultron. All right. Number two, Ant-Man. Okay. So, uh, Ant-Man was surprising to say the least. Uh, cause, well, I really didn't know what to expect out of it. I, as much as pretty much anyone who knew anything about this movie, was well aware of, like, Edgar Wright kind of being attached to this role, it being, like, in development for years, not like they were filming it for years, but, like, it kind of was in that weird development hell phase movies go through since, like, phase one of the Marvel Universe. So, like, years and years ago now. Um, and then when they finally started filming, Edgar Wright kind of walked the project. And I'm a fan of him as much as everyone else. Uh, I like Shaun of the Dead, uh, At the World's End, or whatever it's called, and, uh, what's the other one? I know he did Paul. Oh, and Hot Fuzz, which is a brilliant movie. So, his vision of Ant-Man probably would have been great. But what they ended up with wasn't bad either. I can't say I was disappointed. And look, I, I remember when they had Comic-Con last year, and they were talking about Ant-Man, and people were booing them. That was a little harsh for something that people had no idea what it was going to happen, no idea where it was going, and no idea what was going on behind the scenes. So, like, <laughs> that part was frustrating, and the whole Edgar Wright not being there automatically makes this movie bad was way too rash. Like, that's a crazy position to take. So in the end, I kind of was just going to uh, take it with a grain of salt. I assumed that it being a Marvel movie, they have shown that they can retain a certain level of quality, even if it isn't going to be perfect. So I assumed it was going to be at least serviceable and just another chapter in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and not that big a deal if it wasn't the best chapter. Like, we've had, like, Iron Man 2 and Thor 2, and they've been a little underwhelming. So it would be okay, but it, I didn't expect anything more than that. But man, Ant-Man is awesome, and in the end... I find it as a complete project more fun and fulfilling than Age of Ultron, which surprises the crap out of me, like, like when I figured that out, because that, I never would have expected that. I figured it was going to be okay and Age of Ultron was going to be awesome. Age of Ultron was awesome, but Ant-Man is somehow better. I, I've seen Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. I've seen shrinking movies. It's not like it's, anything that original or interesting but man do they do some really cool stuff with this and they do some great stuff with the movie as a whole it's funny you get a sense of where edgar wright would have really made stuff work but they do a great job with here regardless they do a lot of really cool things with the ants with shrinking with the idea of the microverse with the idea of wasp and like that potential future um and overall it's a great movie i was amazed and thoroughly enjoyed it yeah so i don't have much to say otherwise because i don't really have many problems with it this was almost going to be my top choice it very narrowly doesn't quite beat the top um position and we'll get into why when i talk about number one but ant-man was great um i loved the cast i thought paul rudd was a good fit for scott lang i kind of figured he would be because he has the right personality for it so he's just essentially being Paul Rudd, but he fits well in the role. And I'm really looking forward to seeing him in Civil War now. See, the thing is to learn about Ant-Man 2 is it's not like it doesn't do the world building like Age of Ultron. It just fit in a lot better. Um, that's the problem with Age of Ultron is like, they'd be doing their story and then all of a sudden Scarlet Witch would touch Thor and we're going to start talking about Ragnarok for some reason. Then they'd be going about their story, and Thor, again Thor for some reason, would go off and have a vision quest to learn about the Infinity Wars, which also happened to Iron Man earlier. I forgot about that uh, that vision, because there's like three or four visions in this story, which I guess makes sense if you're going to debut a character called Vision. Uh, anyways, <laughs> um, and then at the very end, we have more of that. And the only one that really worked for me was the Thanos ending at the end, even though... It doesn't make sense for him to go, fine, I'll do it myself, because he never really gave Ultron those orders, right? Whatever. 
as you can see, I'm not a fan of the world building stuff in Age of Ultron because it didn't feel like it fit. It was weird and out of place relative to the story they were telling. They did, even in the first Avengers movie, they did a better job because that was where Loki got his power from was these guys who like were eventually revealed to be Thanos, which didn't really matter at the time, but would be important even for the general public later because that's who's behind all of this. This stuff just felt completely disconnected from Age of Ultron, all this world building stuff. In Ant-Man, there's a little bit of world building kind of at the beginning and that works really well. And then they have this amazing fight scene between Scott and the Falcon. And holy crap, that's like the best part of the movie. And the way they introduce it, where he's like, oh, this is an Avengers compound. And then they kind of get into this classic kind of like superhero misunderstanding and they fight each other. That was perfect. That was, that made the, well, no, it didn't. But that like was a huge part of why I like this movie, because it did this right. And it, that's like perfect world building. And then at the end, they kind of have something that's almost like a direct little tease for Civil War. And that's okay too, because it's at the end of the movie, which they had already kind of linked to the Avengers to begin with. So it all kind of worked for me. That made sense and it leads into the next movie. And you can do that at the end, <laughs> but you can't do it like halfway through your movie without it kind of fitting more seamlessly in the story. They needed to go to that Avengers compound as part of the ongoing plot of Ant-Man. So it felt like a reasonable interlude and a reasonable way to kind of start bringing Scott into the larger universe. So everything about Ant-Man in my eyes works. Um, and oh boy, the ending of Ant-Man is amazing. I can't believe I almost forgot to talk about it. The way that they, okay, I'm gonna, if you haven't seen Ant-Man, you need to go watch that movie right now because I'm about to give away the ending. But basically, it takes place in a little girl's room. <laughs> And the way they go about doing that is just so brilliant and effective. Like, it's just, ah, it's so fun. Everything about Ant-Man is a lot of fun and actually does manage to use its serious points well and kind of convey some good drama as well. And excellent action. It's, it's thoroughly fun. I honestly am surprised that it didn't make number one, but there's a reason for it and let's get to it. <laughs> All right, my number one comic book adaptation for 2015 is Kingsman, The Secret Service. So, I had heard good things about this movie, but I didn't really get around to watching it until I was preparing this list because, eh, I had seen enough movies last year and I didn't really feel the overwhelming need to see this one as well. But I should have because it was awesome when I finally did watch it. And I should have known better. Yes, because like Matthew Vaughn adapting a Mark Miller comic worked really well for KCAS. Matthew Vaughn's a very good adapter. He did a great job, in my opinion, with First Class. He did an even better job with Kick-Ass. And here is my favorite movie of the year. Not just a comic book adaptation. This is the one I enjoyed the most. That includes like Mad Max, Jurassic World, although I wouldn't rate that among my favorite. But all these other movies that came out, this is the one that sticks in my head as like, yeah. This is my favorite, but it is by no means a perfect movie, and it has a lot of Mark Millerisms where like crazy stuff happens that might be a, a better idea in concept than execution. And of course, Bond just embraces all the crazy and has fun with it, and you end up just kind of being swept up in it, in spite of there being some pretty weird, ridiculous stuff. But it's kind of like satirizing James Bond and kind of not, and also taking it seriously and kind of telling its own take on the story and. It all serves to create this focused universe. And again, we come back to the theme of focus. Like Gotham, like Gods and Monsters, it really has an idea of what it wants to be, and it does it perfectly. It also has some of the best cinematic like fight scenes I've ever friggin' seen. The church scene. This takes the number one spot probably because of the church scene, but even if you pluck that out of the movie entirely and just did away with it, the movie would still be awesome because there's a ton of other excellent scenes when they're skydiving, the climatic ending or the little, <laughs> even the very last part of the movie, which is a bit of like a, just a dumb, dirty joke was pretty funny and I enjoyed too. But, uh, uh I don't know. I didn't expect much of it. I haven't read Kingsman, uh, the comics. So I didn't really, like I had a vague idea of what it was about and I have read enough of Mark Miller to know what to expect out of his comics. <laughs> So that's why I haven't really read it, to be honest. But, man, this was a good movie. If you haven't seen this movie, you are missing out. 
And it ends up being the only adaptation on this list not by Marvel or DC. And it takes the number one spot. And I felt weird about doing that because to me, like, The Walking Dead didn't quite make it. And those are really the only two main things I could find that came out last year. But this deserves number one. Ugh. That church scene is awesome and sticks with me and it's just so fun. Ah, this movie is just a refreshing breeze of fun and awesome epicness and everything good about movies. It's an escape. It's, it's just like this fun time from start to finish. And it, it leaves you like with just like a feeling of wanting more, of just enjoying the experience that you had and really thoroughly liking it from start to finish. Uh, like, I don't know what else to say about it, because it's just so good. Everyone does a good job. Even stuff that other people have criticized and found weird, like Samuel L. Jackson's performance. I'm not going to say it wasn't weird and different and kind of its own thing, but I still enjoyed it. It was still interesting, and it was still fun. <laughs> like, uh, I don't know what else to say. It's it's just good. Thoroughly good. Thoroughly enjoyable. Um, to be honest, I'll, it's weird that the top three things were all movies, but all three of these movies were that same spirit of just, like, a good, fun summer movie. Were they, like, thought-provoking critiques on the human nature? Nope. Not one of them. There is depth to what they do, but it's in how they convey their relatively simple messages. I don't think they have, like, this profound philosophy, but they're all very effective at delivering a certain mood and leaving you with a certain feeling and going on this emotional journey. And they end up beating everything else on this list because they're this complete experience because of it. Yeah, it's a little unfair that they take the number one spots because they have a budget, unlike TV shows. I don't know how much Age of Ultron costs, but it's in the double digits for millions, that's for sure, if not triple. Probably a good hundred million to make. Probably. If not more. Uh, I know Daredevil and Jessica Jones has two million an episode, so I do try and judge these things relative to their budget. But even then, these are fun movies and really fun experiences. And I, I feel like if you, in all three of them, Age of Ultron, Ant-Man, and Kingsman, still in that order, but if you, if you stripped out the special effects in any of these and just kind of had the same idea, but with like somehow finding a way to cut out the Hulk a little bit or just make him some guy in a green suit, like if they somehow were able to make this at a lower budget and it just like, didn't quite have the same effects or big stars, I still think they would have been fun movies. Maybe not as good, but they have this spirit to them that's so enjoyable uh, that I think they deserve the top spot in adaptations this year. All three of them kind of took the comics and went in their own direction and told their own story and did a really good job. But Kingsman just has the best moments, and some of the best moments I've seen in action movies in general. It's so fun. That church scene. I cannot get over that church scene. From the way it's scored, to the way it's set up, to the way it's choreographed, to the way it's filmed. It's just so great. Yeah. No, it's brilliant. The way that, like, Colin Firth, like, kind of just burst into violence, and they don't really explain it too much. You just sort of figure it out through the choreography and stuff. You realize he isn't really in control. That that phone thing did something to him and everyone in the church because they're all just killing each other. Then you realize he's getting shot and he's still going because this is some weird tripped up mind control thing, which also communicates how effective it is. But you know what's going to happen next to his character. Because, like, he gets shot, like, two or three times, and he still just keeps going, but it's like, oh, he's done. Like, it's already kind of obvious, like, he's a mentor, and he's on this dangerous mission and stuff. But you kind of see what's happening without it really communicating it, other than just going through the action scene. And it communicates that so effectively. And then it hits home when he gets outside of the church, and he, like, you know, dies. <laughs> And it's not like it was like a super emotional moment. Like I wasn't, I'm, I doubt people were crying over it, but it resonates with you because you just went through this crazy awesome fight scene. One of the best I've ever seen, like I said. And, you know, I've seen some cool action scenes overall, but that was just something else. The whole movie was just something else. And it ends up being my favorite adaptation. It kind of shows not every adaptation has to be the same thing. 
If anything, I think that's a recurring theme on this list because you have like paranormal shows like Constantine, a very action light show like Jessica Jones. You have kind of a detective -y vibe from Gotham. You have whatever Gods and Monsters was trying to be. And then you have like this secret agent spy stuff from Kingsman. Comic books are not just superhero action fluff. They can be a lot of different things. Even superhero comics can be a lot of different things. This was a good year for showing us that. Um, and yeah, so I have talked long enough. So I think we're going to cut things off here. But I hope you guys enjoyed the list. I do apologize for rambling, but I knew it was going to be rambly either way. Because I, I tend to have like very complicated uh, opinions about movies and TV shows and that sort of thing. Because they're much more dense than um, just a comic book. Like comic books only so many pages. It's relative experience is like half a TV episode. These things are much more substantial. Uh, and there's more to the talk about with them. So it's fun to kind of branch out from this stuff every once in a while. And uh, yeah, let me know what you guys think and what your favorite comic book adaptations for 2015 were in the comment section below. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and keep reading comics.